2 Timothy chapter 4, I'd like to back up a little bit. We went through verse 8 on Sunday morning, but I'd like to back up to verse 6. We'll start there and finish this out. You may note that uh, in many of your Bibles, right above verse 9, it says something like personal concerns or final greetings. And oftentimes we'll see something like that, headings in the Scripture, and think, well, that's not really going to apply to me. Paul's just saying goodbye, and so we skip on. Or we briskly rush through it, and we miss so much, as you will see tonight. This is rich teaching, straight from the heart of the Spirit of God, and to me, as impactful, if not more so, than a lot of what we've even seen already in Second Timothy. These are not just personal concerns. I'd also encourage you, if you want to, take a pen and just write through all the headings, the man-made headings that get stuck into the Scriptures, and just let the Scriptures be the Scriptures. Verse 6, Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And of course, Sunday morning we talked about that. Preach the word and love his appearing. If you can remember those two simple tenets of our faith, you will be solid in your Christian walk. Preach the word, which means you've got to know it. And love his appearing, which gives you all the impetus and energy and joy and passion to preach the word. And Paul pours this on right now for Timothy because he knows Timothy is going to be left. Timothy is going to now continue on. And Paul wants him to continue on with with strong faith and and just to follow in the example that he's seen. But I want to ask you, how many of us have heard this familiar sound over an airport loudspeaker? (laughs) This is the final boarding call for Delta Flight something, something, something. Delta Flight something, something, something. We're boarding now. And you're like off getting a drink of water, and you're thinking, not good. Got to run. Hurry it up. Get in there. (laughs) Delta's trying to call right now. Delta's trying right now. (laughs) See the stewardess going, is this thing on? (laughs) The time of Paul's departure has come. And you need to let that settle a little bit on your hearts, because unlike anything else that Paul has written, he knows this is it. I think Paul had a sense he would not write another letter. And I invite you as we finish this letter to do the same thing I invited you to do when we started 2 Timothy, and that is to receive it personally. To read it tonight and to consider it as if we were receiving it from Paul in the moment that Timothy was. Try to get into that frame of mind. What, what is Timothy reading and how is he reacting and how is he responding to his beloved Paul who is now saying, this is it. Paul is not suicidal. Paul has not given up. He's not quitting the race. He has run the race. And he knows that he is at, he's at the end. He knows that his death is imminent. And so as he writes this, he is truly departing. Now, I love the word that he uses here. In the Greek, the word departure is analysis. And analysis is a a very picturesque word. A lot of the words in the Greek are. We've talked about how God chose Hebrew primarily in the Hebrew Scriptures and Greek in the New Testament. And these two languages are some of the most picturesque and descriptive in all of history. No wonder God would choose them as the paints, as it were, for his, to, to put on his palette. So in this Greek language, this Greek word, analusis, departure, was used three specific ways by the Greek people. So as Paul says, the time of my departure has come, it's, it's a ship weighing anchor and sailing away from port. They would say analysis. Or a, a farmer unyoking his oxen at the end of a long day, analysis, a departure now from the work. The work is done, and now I'm departing to go home. Or finally, a traveler packing up a tent at the end of a long stay somewhere, and again, heading for home. So that that concept of I'm departing, but I'm going somewhere, I'm going back, I'm going to where I belong, I'm going to my home, that is kind of inherent in this word. And I really like that last one, a traveler, packing up a tent at the end of a long stay because Paul said roughly a decade earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 4, he said, For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, 
because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by what is life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And that is such a different sensibility than any human being typically has. We want to be in the body as long as possible, right? At least the the flesh wants that, fights for life, wants to be here. And yet Paul's saying, when you give your life to Jesus, it's the opposite. We start thinking about our departure. We start thinking about packing up this old tent and heading for home. Try not to be any more at home in the body than you would be at a KOA campground. (laughs) Okay, it's fun. It's enjoyable for a time. But eventually you got to pack it up and pack it out and head for home. And you know the first night back home in your own bed is a good night. (laughs) Think in terms of uh, of that. Jesus, we're told in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is the same root word that Paul uses when he says uh, we are in this tent, in this body. We're in a a tabernacle, if you were, if you will. Skenuo is the word. We're in a tabernacle, and then John says Jesus tabernacled among us. It was a temporary stay. Jesus knew it would be, just like it is for every single one of us. It is a temporary housing. These tents need to be broken down and packed up so that we are ready to go. The time of our departure is near. The time of my departure has come, Paul said. Well, mine is just around the corner and so is yours. It could be at any time. And so Paul says this as he's closing out the letter. It's time for me to pack up this tent. It is time for me to unyoke from the work of this life. It is time to me to, for me to weigh anchor and sail away home. My departure has come. And you can only write like that if you've longed for that for a long time. Paul has now for many years longed to be home. So now that the time of his departure has come, he's not depressed, he's not worried, he's not fearful. He's actually anticipating. He's looking forward. He said back in Philippians chapter 1, in his first Roman imprisonment, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. It's the weirdest thing for anybody to say, but he's just spot on. I don't know which to choose. If you're saying, Paul, do you want to live or Paul, do you want to die? Boy, let me think about that. Let me pray that one through. I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart. And there's the word, analysis. My departure. I want to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Now, I want you to hold that thought, that remaining on is more necessary for your sake, Paul says. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it. But picking it up now in verse 9, he says to Timothy, make every effort to come to me soon. On the surface, as I said a moment ago, these may seem like incidental closing words. They're not. And there's so much to be gleaned from these few verses. God inspired them. God has preserved them. In Paul's letter to Timothy, for us tonight, right here and now, to read and to hear and to understand. So make every effort to come to me soon. Paul doesn't expect to be around, as we're talking about. He expects to go quickly, and so he invites Timothy to come quickly. Which is interesting, because if he thinks he's going to be going quickly himself, why even waste Timothy's time? Timothy's all the way down in Ephesus. The distance from Ephesus to Rome, that's quite a journey. But Paul is saying, make every effort to get here, Timothy. The phrase is interesting. Make every effort. We have seen this phrase before. The phrase is, the word is actually, spudazo. Make every effort is also, be diligent. Same word is 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Paul uses this word diligence 
when he's saying, this is important. Put this at the top of your priority list. This is at the top of the to-do list. Get this done. Be diligent to take care of this. And he uses the same word now to say to Timothy, I need you to get to me fast. I need you to move this one up to the top of the to-do list. Come visit me soon. Make every effort. Be diligent, Timothy. And this brings us to the first of what I will give you about eight different concerns that Paul has in these last verses. And number one is urgency. There is urgency in Paul's words. Closing out the letter, be diligent. Get here quickly. Make it a high priority. You know, there are a lot of things in our lives that can appear urgent or seem to be urgent. In fact, Les likes to use the phrase, the tyranny of the urgent. And it is a tyrannous thing in our lives that there are so many issues that can crop up and you've got to deal with this now, you've got to deal with that now. And if we would step back and take a deep breath, we would discover, I don't have to deal with that now. I really don't have, I can, that doesn't have to be done by Thursday, you know. I can wait on the Lord. And there are many things in our lives that waiting would be far better than jumping in. This is not one of them. When Paul says, make every effort to come to me soon, this is now, this is urgent. you got to move, Timothy. How do we know the difference between what is eternally significant, that's urgent, and what's just the tyranny of the urgent? Because both go on in our lives. There are some things that need to be done now, and there's eternal consequence. And there are other things that really don't need to take the time of day, not now, they're just getting in the way. How do I know which is which? And I would say, remember what Jesus said to Martha. When she bustled around the house, cleaning and preparing and and whining as her sister Mary just sat there at Jesus' feet, listen to what he said, Luke 10, 41, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. So how do we tell what's, what's truly urgent and, and what is not? What do we do when we feel like we're being pulled in so many directions? Go there, do this, get that done, answer my text, return my cell call, meet my needs. How do we know what we're, how we are to reply? Ask yourself the question, does the urgency have eternal bearing? And do I hear Jesus in it? Do I hear Jesus in it? Something's got to be done right now. Why? Do you hear Jesus in it? Do you hear his voice saying, I need you to be diligent about this? Or is it all the other voices in our lives that clamor for attention? Is the voice of Jesus heard in it? You see, a servant of the eternal gospel of Jesus can discern when the urgency is eternal. And it always brings us back to Jesus. It always centers us in on Jesus and focuses us on Him. We know it's important because Jesus is in it. Paul knew his end was coming on fast, and so he writes with urgency. And the Jesus part of this urgency for Timothy is, this is his mentor. This is the man who brought him to Christ. This is probably the one who baptized him, certainly the one who, who introduced him and, and, and through whom Timothy has gleaned his faith. This is the one who led Timothy and showed Timothy and now is handing over to Timothy in many ways authority and leadership to continue on. Make every effort to come to me soon. Is Jesus in this? You better believe Jesus is in this. And so we see an urgency in Paul's language. Secondly, Paul writes for company, which is part of the reason we're all crammed into the fireside room tonight. It feels a whole lot more like company right now than it does sometimes in the auditorium on a Wednesday when we're all spread out. Company, what do you mean? Look at verse 10. After saying, make every effort to come to me soon, he says, for Damas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. What's going on here? Paul is lonely. 
Paul is feeling isolated. All he has is a doctor to talk to him. Have you ever talked to a doctor? I don't know half of what they're saying. I've got a couple of really good friends who are doctors, and they talk to me, and I always have to go, wait, whoa, whoa, in stupid terms. You know, so I get what you're talking about here. Luke's there, but he says, come soon, Timothy. Come quickly. He says several things. He says, bring Mark, you know. And here we see this, and it amazes me, an apostle to the Gentiles. You know, there's this great missionary of the church, writer of most of the New Testament letters, This is the same man who was lifted up to the third heaven in that amazing vision, and he's lonely. He's lonely. Why? Because Paul is just like you. He's just like me. And there is a basic human need that we see in the apostle that is present in all of us, and that is just the need for company. That we were not made to do this alone. Paul wasn't. Sometimes I think we can think of him that way, the apostle, the saint, St. Paul, out doing it, you know, just the, the lone figure out there fighting the good fight. He fought the good fight, and he won because he was surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and he was surrounded by fellow believers. He always traveled with people. He always set out on missionary journeys with others. And the rare times, like when he went from Athens down to Corinth by himself, in those rare moments, he was very lonely. And so here again, Paul is lonely. Some had to leave him for ministry's sake, and that happens. Crescens and Titus and Tychicus, they didn't leave Paul because they wanted to. They, they had to. The, the ministry was calling. I shared several years ago, I have a, a really close friend named Jeff Mile. And Jeff and I did youth ministry together in California, and and during that whole time, we just really clicked, had a great time, and and, and always thought, boy, someday it'd be really cool to do do a church together. You know, and then I started the bridge 14 years ago. About a year after that, Jeff started, planted a church in Arizona. And we realized at that time, we probably would never get the chance to work together again in this life. But you know what? Ministry had to happen. Jeff is an amazing teacher of the word. He needed to be elsewhere. He needed to be able to be used by God. And I understood that. But, you know, he had to leave and I had to go this way. He went that way. It was ministry. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes people leave this body because the Lord is moving them to other places and other locations for the sake of the kingdom. And that's legit. But some people had also bailed on Paul. And that's not cool. The one thing that breaks my heart is when people leave a fellowship, you know, out of frustration. We're not to do that. By the way, if you ever have an issue that would make you an issue so frustrating for you that you would want to leave our fellowship, would you do me a favor and make sure that everything is copacetic in our relationships before going? Make sure it's the Lord who's actually leading you elsewhere and and not frustration Because when you leave a a fellowship out of frustration, it never leaves you. It will always be with you. We are called to love each other and to to be family together. But again, sometimes people do bail out. And Damas has done this. Damas, who we talked about on Sunday, who loved this world. Paul had just finished saying, for all those who love his appearing, but Damas loves this present world. And John said in 1 John 2.15, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This Feel the heartbreak a little bit here because Paul and Damas worked closely together. We see this in other scriptures. They were close partners in ministry. Colossians chapter 4 verse 14, the book of Philemon. Damas is mentioned in both places and his desertion hurt Paul. Which is why there's even a mention of it here. And you all know in six days of creation, there was really only one thing God said was not good. Right? It's not good for a man to be alone. Genesis 2.18. And so he created the first radio in the Bible. Have you heard this? That, that God took a rib out of Adam and created a loudspeaker. And it, it worked. <laughs> Just kidding. 
<laughs> Quick, Rick, think of something. Say something. Move on. It's not good for a man to be alone. And, and you know, the first thing I think when I read that, that scripture, that's Genesis 2.18, first thing I think is married people, your spouse is your primary partner, your, your best friend, the person who needs to be your accountability partner and the one you go to first in all things. However, that said, we also, we need our Timothys. We need our Pauls. We need our Peters. We need our Johns. We need our, our, our Jameses. We need our Jeffs. I need my Jeff D'Angelo. You know, I was talking about my, my friend Jeff. I've had cer- certain Jeffs in my life. I think they've been kind of pillars in, in moments of my life. And, and then along comes Jeff D'Angelo. And... <laughs> I appreciate Jeff so much, and I, I'm, not, I'm really not saying this to embarrass him or anything, but we go back to the very beginning of this fellowship together, and there was a, a confidence and a strength and an encouragement that I drew off of and continue to draw off of to this day, because my friend is in this with me. and I, it's, it's You all know what I mean. When you're in it together, it, it is such a blessing, and we all need that. Think about the 12 apostles. Close compadres, even before they began to understand what this was all about, as Jesus called them, we're talking about Peter and Andrew were brothers. Uh, Philip was from their town, Bethsaida. There's James and John. They were brothers, and they were probably cousins of Jesus. So there's a lot of close association and, and understanding, and these guys, many already knew each other before they came into this ministry that Jesus called them to. But check this out. Do you know the number one reason that is given for Jesus calling the apostles? Let me read this. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. He went up on the mountain and he summoned those whom he himself wanted. Jesus played favorites? Yes, he did. He chose the ones he wanted to be surrounded by. He chose the twelve because he saw in them, oh, ministry potential, and he knew that these were the ones who would change the world, and Judas was among them. And Peter, and these guys who we see clumsily trying to follow and fleeing him when it got tough three years later. But these were the guys Jesus wanted. And and verse 14 of Mark chapter 3 says, He appointed twelve so that... Here's the number one reason, so that they would be with him. And that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. Casting out the demons was third on the list. Preaching was second on the list, first on the list, that they would be with him. Because relationship is so important to Jesus. That's where everything gets passed along. That's why we see this relationship with Paul and Timothy. It's so significant in the ministry that they would do. And so Paul chose that company and that camaraderie with Timothy. And as Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And I like that. But after saying only Luke is with me in verse 11, he also says this, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. And in this little verse, we get insight into number three, maturity. Urgency, company, maturity. Number three. Mark's gospel is the only one that contains this interesting parable of Jesus. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Jesus was saying the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night, and he gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How, he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. And when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come and and it's a a beautiful picture of the kingdom that it it grows over time you know as jesus said uh, first the blade and then the head and then the mature grain in the head so this is going to be a thing jesus is saying indicating this kingdom is going to take some time to grow and mature until it's ready for harvest but it's also indicative of the maturing process of a believer that a believer comes to faith in Jesus and doesn't instantly have it all. You know, first the blade. Praise God for the blade. 
and then the head. Well, that's cool. And then the mature grain. And that's the process of our lives. And we see this in Mark. Mark, who Paul here says now, is useful for me in service. But that's not how Mark started out. If you track the life of Mark or listen to it in the scriptures, as a young man, it seems like everywhere he was Forrest Gump. Why? Because he was running. (laughs) What do we see of Mark? We see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark chapter 14, verse 50. They all left Jesus and fled, and a young man was following him. All of the early church fathers believe it was Mark, and there's really good evidence to think that Mark was this young man. He was wearing a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and became the first streaker. That was Mark. (laughs) No, he escaped naked. And and that's a weird little little mention in only in the book of Mark. You're not going to read it in the other Gospels about this young man in a sheet who ran away naked. And it's like, okay, first of all, the whole clothing thing, I'm, I'm really concerned. What is he doing in the garden in a sheet? It's very likely that Mark's mother, her house in Jerusalem was kind of a, already a meeting place for the disciples. And in fact, when Peter would eventually be released from prison, Acts chapter 12, that's where they were meeting, was Mark's mother's house. So it's likely that at some point they were there that day, before on that night when they ended up in the garden. And Mark, as a young man, perhaps was in bed and saw them heading that way and just wrapped up and went out to see what was going on. And when he got out there, trouble starts. Here come the Roman soldiers. Oh, no, this is not good. i got to get out of here. They grab him, and, and he flees naked. So that at least gives some potential reality to what, to what actually happened. But he's running away. Well, then Paul and Barnabas head off on their first missionary journey, and Barnabas says, well, let's take my cousin, Mark. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, when you read Acts 13, it's like, okay, so he just went back to Jerusalem. They must have had an errand for him. No, he deserted. And we don't find that out until it's time for Paul and Barnabas to leave on the second missionary journey. Acts 15.38, Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that Paul and Barnabas separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus and Paul went the land route up around back into Galatia. Both cases, as a young man, Mark takes off running. Now he's a little bit older but still young and goes out on this first mission and he can't take the pressure so he runs home to Mama. Mark is running, but runaway Mark has been maturing. This is an important story in the scriptures because it speaks to every one of us, especially when we fail in our faith. You're going to. I'm going to. I am not the man I'm going to be in 10 years, Lord willing, and the saints don't rise. I am still on that process. As long as you're drawing breath, you are still maturing. So when you fall down, when you fail, when you get fearful or run away, remember Mark. Remember, it's first the blade and then the head, and then the full grain. That God is maturing all of us and working on this. And I love the fact that Paul sees this. I mean, Paul, Paul's intense, no doubt about it. Reading his letters, and we've seen this, this was an intense guy. He was serious about the gospel. He was, you know, all, all power straight forward. The guy was nonstop go. And anyone like Mark who was going to, you know, damage the mission at all, I'm sorry, you've you got to get left because we got to go. But here at the end of his life, Paul's looking back and going, I need Mark. I'd like you to bring Mark. He, he is useful. And Paul, while he knows the intense passion of the gospel, also sees the value of maturity. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain. And he sees it in Mark. And I think Paul also recognizes it in himself. Because he's more willing now to work with Mark than maybe he was previously. So, matters of urgency and company and maturity, and all of a sudden here, in verse 13, we get a sense of Paul's simplicity. Look at verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak, which I left 
at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchment. And it's one of my favorite verses in this letter. It, it's just so plain and simple and okay, Paul just needed some stuff. What's next? And we go right on. Don't go right on. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. As Paul gets his house in order, you need to recognize he has no house. This is all Paul has. It's all he really needs, just a few books to read, to pass the time, some scriptures to consider and pray over and continue to think through right up to the end. His cloak, because it's getting a little cold. He's heading into wintertime. He's in a dank cell, as we talked about. And he'd like to wear his cloak. He doesn't call for his financial advisor, his lawyer, or his insurance agent. The entirety of Paul's holdings on earth are a cloak and some books and parchment. And that's it. And I think, fellow Americans, that is instructive for us. Because the more stuff we have, the more stuff will tie us down. And I wear this. I think about this often. You know, and here we are considering Christmas, and I don't know what your Christmas morning is going to look like, but Christmas morning in my house looks like Santa Claus threw up. (laughs) It's just wrong. (laughs) On so many levels, I sit there and go, the avarice, the greed. (laughs) Why aren't we teaching our children these things? I'm still dealing with that. Does your stuff have a hold on you? And Paul just doesn't have anything to have a hold on him. And by the way, at his death, neither did Jesus. Even before that. He said in Matthew 8, 20, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so on the cross, all Jesus had, walking out to the cross, were the clothes on his back. There's nothing to tie you down. It's a whole lot easier to be raptured. Easier to go up when you're not stuck here and worried about all these different things. The cloak and the books and the parchment. The cloak, uh, it, that's described as a circular cape with a, a hole in the top for the head. So think of like a, a wool poncho is really what Paul's talking about. It came down um, to about the knees or just below the knees, and it was it was warm for winter wear. And uh, I think that's cool. I think I think they're coming back. In fact, uh, doing the, the Nutcracker this last weekend, I, ha- I wore a cape. Capes are cool. <laughs> and I think as the Bridge Christian Fellowship, it's time for us to bring capes back. <laughs> I do. You should see me in this thing. I look awesome. <laughs> I want a cape. And according to Scripture, it's okay to have a cape at the end of your life. So I would like to have a cape. <laughs> That's what it is, just a basic, you know, jacket. And then the books and parchment. Now, the question has been asked and asked and asked. What are these? These books and the parchment. Were they the Old Testament scriptures? Perhaps Matthew's gospel or Mark's gospel? Doesn't need Luke's gospel because Luke's with him, you know. What are these books and parchment? Are they the collected works of Calvin and and Hobbes? (laughs) What are these books? Scholars have written papers on Paul's papers, trying to figure out what are they. You know what? We don't know. (laughs) And it doesn't matter. Paul's just saying, I'm cold, bring my coat. I'm bored, bring my books. I'm lonely, come and see me. And so in this, we just get this simple, tender, touching conclusion to a letter that, as I said before, people would study for centuries to come. And Paul may not have known that, but the Holy Spirit did. Knew that we needed to hear this and think about it. And so why at the end of all of Paul's glorious teachings do we get a coat and books and parchment? You might think verse 13 is no great theology, and I would argue that it is. For all the doctrines and instructions and missions of Paul, it reminds me that he is just a man, a very real human, with very real human needs. What makes Paul great is the exact same thing that makes you great. And that is Isaiah 57, verse 15. 
Thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place and with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. What makes any person great on this earth is Jesus. As for me, keep it simple. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Even the wounds here in Paul's heart become visible in this last letter. He warns Timothy now, number five, to the threat of injury. Injury. Look at verse 14. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Well, Paul, if you're going to let the Lord repay him, why are you naming him? (laughs) Why are you calling him out like this? Because sometimes a person has to be named, especially when they come against the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 15, Be on guard against him yourself, Timothy, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. So he joins the ranks ranks of of Fugilus and Hermogenes and Hymenaeus and Philetus. You can add Alexander the coppersmith now into that mix. So these are people, call, Paul is calling them out. He doesn't do that very often. Typically in Paul's letters, when he names people, it's because these are brothers and sisters, these are beloved. Greet them, hug them, welcome them, send them on their way, do whatever they need. But here, he names, just in this letter alone, all of those different people who are opposed to the gospel, who are a threat to the gospel, who are a danger. So he lists their names, and here we are 2,000 years later, and we all know Alexander the coppersmith is a bad dude. How'd you like to be named in Scripture like that? Yeah, that Rick Crawford, man, verse 15, tore him up. (laughs) Here's the deal. Paul does not list them because he is vindictive. He lists them because they're dangerous. It's not about him at all. The moment it becomes about me, I'm in trouble. If I start naming people because I want to put them down to to elevate myself or because I've got, you know, some vested interest in making other people look bad, now we're in the wrong place. When it becomes about payback, Paul is not about payback here. He's not trying to undermine these guys to hurt them because they hurt him. And when we do that... Uh, we put ourselves in God's chair. You see, Romans twelve nineteen, Paul said, never take your own revenge. Beloved, leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And I'll take it a step further. Any time a faith or mission or even a church fellowship becomes about my reputation or my pride, I have lost sight of Jesus. This fellowship exists for him. Okay. He could take me out tomorrow and he would bring in another senior pastor and everything would be fine because the fellowship is about him. Not about you and not about me. And I think if we remember that, even when we have our little you know, scuffles in fellowship, when someone wrongs me within the church body, if I'm thinking about Jesus, then the first place my heart goes is, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. Because Paul said in Romans 11.36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So my point here is that in all of this and in calling out Alexander and, and warning against him, Paul is not making himself the issue. He knew that the truth was at stake. That the gospel was being threatened. And so he names these people. He says in verse 16, At my first defense, no one supported me. All deserted me. And then he says, May it not be counted against them. And Paul is just like Jesus there. So Jesus at the end of his life says, Father, forgive them from the cross. Stephen, like we said on Sunday, at the end of his life, Acts 7, verse 60, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And here Paul does the exact same thing. May it not be counted against them. His words are a mirror of Stephen's words, which Paul heard because he was standing there watching all those years before. 
And they are a mirror of Jesus' words of forgiveness. And you wonder if this Alexander the coppersmith did Paul much harm. And the word harm there indicates physical harm. This guy hurt Paul. And if he did all this harm, how in the world can Paul turn around and then say, him and others and those who stood against him and those who deserted them, may the Lord not, may it not be counted against them. How can he do that? Verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. And that's key. We call this number six as we're going through delivery. Delivery. How is Paul able to forgive? How is anyone ever able to truly forgive in the way Jesus did? Because we've been delivered. We ourselves have been forgiven. And we ourselves know that once forgiven, we will be saved out of the lion's mouth. Here it is, the eve of Paul's death. And this is a reminder and an encouragement to Timothy that, that God is like, he's like the UPS guy at my house in December. He always delivers. <laughs> always delivers. Okay. Some of these things in my own head are like, well, that's, that's funny. <laughs> But Paul's delivery wasn't just from harm, it was for the mission. And this is key with Paul. Yes, God delivered him from the hands of Alexander the coppersmith. We don't know the story, we don't know what happened, but God delivered him from that. But it's never just delivery from a difficult situation. It's always delivery, where God is concerned, for the task at hand, for the gospel, for the mission. I have been saved from this circumstance so that I can continue to bring the word of God. I haven't been saved so that I can become fearful and timid and frightened to ever speak out again. If God has delivered you from anything, he has delivered you for the sake of the gospel. Paul knew this. And here again at the end of his life, he, he echoes this statement about being the apostle to the Gentiles. Man, he, he stood by me, he strengthened me. So that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. The apostle of the Gentiles. He said in the first letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 7, For this I was appointed, a preacher, an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And the question I would ask is, well, had all the Gentiles really heard? And Paul could say, every single one to whom I was sent that there wasn't a Gentile that he came in contact with that he didn't share the gospel with. So yes, Paul fulfilled the mission. But he uses an interesting phrase. He says, I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Out of the lion's mouth. Okay, what's he referring to? Some Bible scholars see this as a reference to Nero. I was rescued out of the lion's mouth, out of Nero's hands. That's possible. Others make the biblical connection, maybe you already have, to Daniel. I was rescued out of the lion's mouth, kind of like Daniel in the lion's den. And that's possible. But I think the reference goes deeper than that. I think it's it's referring to another scavenger, another lion, the one that Peter said, 1 Peter 5, 8, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So when Paul says, I was rescued out of the lion's mouth, he's not talking about Alexander the coppersmith or Nero or anyone else. He's talking about the devil. And I was rescued out of his mouth. Now that could relate all the way back to Paul's own salvation on the Damascus Road. Man, talk about being in the mouth of the lion. Paul was one of the teeth. Until Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And saved his life and literally rescued him out of the mouth of the lion. Satan thought he had Paul square on his team. But this connection to the lion being as Satan is interesting. Psalm 22 verse 21 says, save me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. Think about this, Psalm 22. Who's saying that? That is Jesus. 
Psalm 22, the Psalm of the Cross. It is a prayer of Jesus on the cross, inspired by the Spirit of Christ, written down by David a thousand years before it happened. It's amazing to me. And it's in that psalm he said, "Uh, Save me from the lion's mouth. Paul knows his scripture. And Paul is aligning with Jesus, I believe, when he says, I was saved out of the lion's mouth. He's talking about Satan, and he's equating his own salvation to the very salvation Jesus called out for. In the same way Jesus was delivered through resurrection, Paul's delivery was about to come as well. Verse 18, the Lord will rescue me. And that word rescue is delivered. He will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. When he says the Lord will rescue, future tense, me from every evil deed, he knew the next evil deed that was on the list was his execution. That was an evil thing. He was an innocent man. And evil was about to be done to him, but he's going to be rescued from it. Now, you and I could say, well, but wait a minute. He was beheaded. <laughs> he, how is that rescued? Well, from a worldly perspective, harm like that doesn't sound or seem like rescue. But Paul knows the picture is much bigger. He's head, headed straight from there. <laughs> He's headed straight from there <laughs> to heaven. He's on his way. And he will be rescued from that evil deed out of the lion's mouth, brought safely into the heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's our confidence. That's our hope. And and I want to ask you all to do this. And some are in more of a difficult situation right now in life than others. But for every one of you, I want you to think about this. No matter what your life situation The same Jesus who rescued Paul out of the lion's mouth. The same Jesus who rescued him from every evil deed and brought him safely into the heavenly kingdom will do the same for you. He has not forgotten you. I told Les today there are a couple things that have just been coming up over and over and over in the teaching. And maybe it's just me hearing it. But one of them is, is very simply that the Lord will not depart. He does not leave. The rest of the world may leave you, as Paul feels very alone here. But the Lord won't do it. He will rescue you. He will deliver you. He will pull you right out of the lion's mouth. And he's going to bring you and me and all of us together safely into the kingdom. That's, that's the big reality. So whatever my struggle, no matter how difficult in life right now, and Paul's sitting in prison, no matter how difficult, I'm going to be brought out of it. And there is a great plan that... <laughs> marvelously I am a part of and my resurrection is something no one can take away that's the centerpiece of our faith 2 Corinthians 1 9 Paul said indeed we all had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. So your deliverance is secure in Jesus. Your resurrection and mine is right around the corner. So Paul is ready to receive what he had been teaching all those many years. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I think, what a great place to end the letter. But of course, it's Paul. (laughs) And he doesn't. And he continues on, and I'm so thankful he did. Verse 19. Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. And Rastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Make every effort. Be diligent. Come before winter. Eubulus greets you, and also Pudens and Linus and Lucy and and Claudia. (laughs) And all the brethren. And two last things to point out here. Number seven, I think it is on our list. Infirmity. Infirmity. Paul had to leave Trophimus sick. At Miletus. Why didn't he just heal him? Instead of leaving him behind. In fact, why hadn't 
Paul healed Timothy. We talked about this when we studied 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verse 23, where Paul says to Timothy, No longer drink water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Paul, just heal him. Heal Trophimus. Don't leave him behind. And for that matter, why hadn't Paul healed Paul? You got the power of healing, bro. Use it on yourself. Physician, heal thyself. Why hadn't Paul done that? Remember his thorn in the flesh? 2 Corinthians 12, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may dwell in me. I can't say that like Paul could say that. I mean, I I agree. I could speak those words. But I don't know what my thorn in the flesh would be. I, I wasn't in and out of prison like Paul was. I wasn't stoned nearly to death or to death. I wasn't shipwrecked. I wasn't starving. I wasn't beaten. I didn't go through all the things that Paul went through. Man, when Paul says, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, power is perfected in weakness, I go, wow. Paul says that, and that'll preach. And so when he says, I'd rather boast about my weakness, I can take that to heart. But here's the thing. He left Trophimus sick at Miletus because healing was not at Paul's discretion. And neither is it at yours or mine. We can ask for it. We can pray for it. We can believe God for it. And in all cases, we should. But healing is at the discretion of the Holy Spirit. Healing uh, among believers is for the purposes of God. It's for what He wants to accomplish. Deliverance from a, a situation we might cry out to be rescued from, that's up to Him. And instead of saying, Lord, why didn't you deliver me? The question is, Lord, why didn't you deliver me? You hear the difference? What's your purpose in this? What are you doing? Why am I left sick at Miletus? I would guess, and I can only guess this, but there were people in Miletus who needed to hear about Jesus, and Trophimus was just the guy to tell them. So he stuck sick at Miletus. We don't know God's perfect plan, but I'll tell you, sometimes a believer's illness will accomplish the will of God far better than their healing. And so I'm content with that. And I will pray in faith for healing for brothers and sisters. I will cry out on their behalf. But I will also accept that if God doesn't heal in the way I think He should, praise the Lord. He's doing something. Trophimus is needed. C.H. Spurgeon, by the way, gave an entire sermon on 2 Timothy 4, verse 20. Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus. That was the text of his sermon. The whole sermon. He called it The Sick Man Left Behind. And it's worth reading. You can look it up on the web. The Sick Man Left Behind by C.H. Spurgeon. It's a great sermon. Here are the points. Just three of them. Number one, it is the will of God that some good men should be in ill health. Really? Well, I know I've shared before that my grandmother was bedridden with a tumor in her spinal cord for the last 16 years of her life. And we prayed for her healing, and it never came. But I can tell you from my own personal experience that the faith of that woman translated to my faith. And I learned so much about Jesus and about grace and about mercy and love and peace in the midst of suffering from that woman. A marvelous, remarkable person. It's the will of God that some good men, some good women should be in ill health. Secondly, he said, good men may be laid aside when they seem most needed. Lord, how could you take him? Lord, how how come she's in this situation? They could be so much more effective for your kingdom if they were healthy, if they were well, if they were whole. And the Lord's going, really? Would you presuppose to know my plan? And I'm telling some of you that your physical condition is exactly what God is working through. And the way that you walk it out in faith is exactly what God is showing the world. This is what it looks like when someone trusts in me. So whatever the condition, I agree with Spurgeon. 
Sometimes this is just what God's doing. The third point he makes is that good men would have the Lord's work go on whatever becomes of them. And you can hear Trophimus saying, no, Paul, it's cool. You go. You've got to keep going. I'll stay. Keep going. Don't worry about me. And it's just, it's the beautiful attitude of Jesus first. It's all about Jesus and the kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about you. Although he did die for us. But it's about Jesus. Spurgeon concludes that sermon by saying this. Brethren, it will be the sweetest alleviation to the pains of a sick pastor if he sees you each and all nerved to a special diligence. His enforced rest will be the better enjoyed if he knows that the church of God is not suffering because of it. And his whole mind and spirit will be will, will minister to the health of his body if he sees the fruit of the Spirit of God in all of you, keeping you faithful and zealous. Will you not see to this for Jesus' sake? And that's the other thing I told Les that I've been noticing just emerging in teaching over and over and over. The first being that Jesus does not depart, and the second being is that this gospel is ours. That the responsibility to preach the word is yours every bit as much as it is mine. This is, we share this thing. We carry this together. Let's not rely on the pastor to bring it. No, blessed and happy is the pastor whose fellowship is out preaching him. Please, go for it. Now the last thing Paul does before putting down his pen is he names this precious group of people. Again, we see Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus and Erastus and Trophimus and Eubulus and Pudens and Linus and Claudia. And I renamed them all again and even says, and all the brethren, I say their names again because these are some precious people. These are people who understood exactly what I was just saying. These are people who continued to carry the gospel long after Paul was dead and gone. These are people through whom we have received the gospel now. If these all gave up, if they all shrank back and quit, where would we be? But they are all on board, and Paul names them and loves them because, number eight, it was all about family. It's all about family. Last night, I don't know if you all heard this, but uh, Leslie Kramer's dad, Bob, died and went home to be with the Lord. His physical body died. He went home to be with Jesus. Cheryl got the call from Leslie early in the day, around 10, 30, 11 in the morning, and and she went out to the hospital, and she spent the day out there. Cheryl doesn't always do that, so if you're sick in the hospital, don't plan on her coming to visit you, because (laughs) she had a special relationship with Bob. He kept telling her he wanted to take her out on a date. (laughs) I, for one, was glad when he ended up in the wheelchair, because I had better odds at that point. Um, But he kept saying that. He just, they had a funny relationship, and he, he, those of you who know Bob know he was kind of a tease anyway. And so she went out there, and, and she was in the room with him throughout the whole day, and all the way up to, I, I, I went out there in the evening, and I left about 7.30, and I said, do you, you want to come home? And she said, I feel like I need to be here. So she just stayed. Around 10.30, I had a text from Cheryl. He passed away. He went, he went home. And then Cheryl came home. And if you don't know my wife, you probably don't know that she doesn't cry. Hallmark commercials, I'm over there just weeping. She's looking at me like... (laughs) She was the perfect women's director because she's not emotional, you know, all this stuff. Boy, that's that's two tonight, Mike. I'm going to get in big trouble here. (laughs) But she came home and came in, and she looked weary and tired. It had been a long day, and and, uh, she sat down, and I was talking to her, and her eyes just filled with tears. And I said... I said, you're going to miss him, aren't you? And she goes, it's not that. She said, it's not that. She said, I don't even know how to explain this, but in the moment that he died, Cheryl said, I felt like I was right there. Like I was on this side of the door as it opened. Like I was that close. She said, we felt the presence of God in that room. And she said, I I felt like if I had taken a step forward, I would be in eternity. She said, I don't know how else to describe that. And, and you know, this, again, my non-crying wife, so moved and, and so emotional about this, this situation because she felt like she was standing right there at the door of heaven. Now, you need to understand, as her husband, 
I'm watching how emotional she is about missing the opportunity to go on home, and I'm thinking, you're not leaving me with these kids. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I, I sat there and I listened to her for a moment, and, and all kidding aside, what came to my heart and what I share with her, I will share with you. From Paul's imprisonment just five years before this final letter, he said, I am hard-pressed from both directions. We just read this verse. Having the desire to depart, to go through that door, to be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And my point is this. I said, Cheryl, you know what? Some days, I know, you just want to go home. There are many days. I would, I just, could we just go home now? We, we kind of talk about this, don't we, from time to time. Wouldn't it be great if the rapture was tonight and we wouldn't have to go home and finish rapping? <laughs> or whatever, you know. Wouldn't it be nice if it was today or tomorrow or before this happens in four weeks or before? You know, just take us home. But you know what? We need to remain. We need to remain one way or the other until Jesus calls us home. Because if we're here... He needs us to be here. We may be Trophimus in Miletus. We may be Paul in prison. We may be Timothy wondering how he's going to continue in Ephesus. But if we're here, he needs us to be here. We remain on. Why? Because it's about family. I am here for your sake and you are here for my sake. We need each other. And this world desperately, hear me on this, desperately needs us. Not because we're so great, but because, because we have a message. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is the only hope this world has. And so until Jesus says, come on, we stick it out. We remain because, as Paul says, that is much more necessary for your sake. Paul could say to Timothy, he needs you here. Just a little bit longer. And then Paul says, verse 22... The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Two final thoughts here. The Lord be with your spirit. That is huge. Because in all of this staying, in all of this remaining, in all of this dealing with the difficulties and our own imprisonments or our own illnesses or our own problems in life, in all of that, the Lord is with your spirit. Meaning what? Meaning, you've heard this many times, my, one of my favorite verses, Isaiah 11, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and strength, of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit that indwelt Jesus. That was His Spirit. The Lord be with your Spirit. That is His Spirit with you. Because He does not depart. Because He does not leave us. And then the final words of Paul in the Bible, grace be with you. And that was always his message, the message of grace. Holy Father, thank you for Paul's words. We know they're yours. Thank you for allowing this window into, Lord, a very personal side of Paul's life and heart here at the very end. Thank you for what you speak to us and what you share with us and and what we can take from this. Father, I I just pray. We all all do long for our departure. We want to set sail. We want to sail away home. But Lord, we know you've called us to remain. Some of the conditions of our remaining, Lord, they're, they're not great. But they're necessary. And I pray, Father... Not so much that you tell us why they're necessary, but give us the faith to trust that they are. Give us the wherewithal until you call us to continue to walk in this world in the name of Jesus Christ and by his grace. And that's the last thing. I I thank you for your grace. Your grace was sufficient for Paul. Your grace, Father, is sufficient for us here tonight. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.